is my audio working? Is the question. Ah. Is my audio working? Ha! Is the question. Well, that sounded a lot better on my side. Okay, then I'm just going to go on as if everything is okay and we'll sort it out later because, yeah, not, the, the people who would normally be watching live, I'm sure I lost people because I've had to change the URL and some people will find me, some people won't, but we'll go back. So I'm going to start over. <clears throat> uh, my name is Mark Sabatella. <laughs> Welcome to the Music Work Cafe for today, uh, January 13th. 2021. So the, the topic that I want to talk about today is I'm going way, way, way back into my own history with MuseScore. Uh, in particular, I'm going to be looking at the very first score that I entered. When I say the very first score, I don't mean like, you know, obviously I played around entering some notes here and there, but as far as something I actually like worked on and, and like actually created and saved and uploaded to MuseScore.com. Here is my profile on MuseScore.com and you see there are 33 pages worth of scores. And this here is score number one. It's called Dusk. And Dusk here is, yeah, it's score number one. And actually, I have the uh, video here. And I want to talk about where this came from, what was involved, and then, you know, just sort of revisit a little bit. Uh, here it is. All right, I'm going to pause it there. It, the syncing is not correct, so you're not seeing stuff at the proper time. And I want to now, I need to get back to my chat because uh, the chat, unfortunately, is um, got busted. So uh, here we go. So anyhow, this piece started out life as an orchestra piece. Um, sounds quiet, really. Well, it was a pretty quiet piece. Um, it, it, it started off very small, so I'm not going to worry about that too much. We're going to uh, just sort of assume that that's, that that's the way it is. Um, uh, but I'm going to go into MuseScore here. So uh, let, me, let me give you a little background. I went back and got my master's degree in music in 2005-2006. And while I was a student working on my master's degree, I was, uh, you know, uh, working on a composition degree. And I wrote this piece for orchestra, for like a full orchestra. And I wrote it in finale. MuseScore wasn't really a thing yet, or at least not a thing that was, it was, this was before MuseScore 1 ever came out. So I was using finale. And, um... I wrote the piece uh, for orchestra, and it was performed by the University Symphony, uh, University of Denver. And so I actually have a recording of that that I'm going to play you just a little bit of so you can hear. I've, I've, I've played this uh, before uh, in some other contexts, so it was on my mind. Here's that opening. So it starts off small. If I jump somewhere further in, you'll hear it gets to much bigger climaxes.
So one thing I will tell you um, is it's it's really <laughs> it's really a rush to if if you write for a large ensemble and get to hear it performed by that large ensemble. I mean it's it's an amazing feeling, and and yeah, that was it was pretty incredible uh, to have that opportunity to uh, get to write and have the university uh, orchestra um, perform it, and. Uh, but I always liked the piece, but I just wrote it sort of as a class exercise. I didn't really know what to do with it other than that. Um, and something happened like 10 years ago this month, uh, this, there's a, 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 an ensemble called the Playground Ensemble here in the Denver area that they do modern, modern classical, uh, compositions mostly. Um, and they decided to do a jazz project where they were going to um, commission a bunch of uh, jazz composers locally to uh, write music that would sort of cross a bridge, that would have jazz influence but be performable by these classical musicians. And they brought in some guest jazz musicians also. And so I was one of the composers they asked to write for this. And so I decided I would take that orchestra, orchestra piece and reduce it down to something that uh, could be played by this smaller ensemble. I, I believe it was eight pieces. I guess we'll see that in a moment. Furthermore, I had just found out about MuseScore uh, like a few months ago, just been playing around with it, and was it was looking promising. And just on a whim, really, I decided, you know what, I'm going to see if I can do this commission in MuseScore. I, I I, it was a leap of faith because <laughs> this was all very quick uh, coming together. I mean, it was just a few weeks. You know, they basically asked us to write the music, and then we had like a month to write it and and then rehearse it and then perform it. And I just decided I was going to do this. And so I had like three weeks to write this music, and I just decided I was going to immerse myself in MuseScore to do it. And I had never really used MuseScore before other than just to poke around and see what it could do. But they, I knew they were just getting ready to release MuseScore score one. And when I say they, yeah, I mean they. I mean, I had no connection to MuseScore at this point other than just, you know, someone who was poking around. And it was 0 0.9.6 at the time. Um, 0963, I think, was the full uh, release version. So they were getting ready to put out MuseScore 1, and so I got a pre-release, like a beta version of MuseScore 1 that I did all this in. And what I did is... As I said, the orchestra version was done in Finale. Finale can export to Music XML. Music XML is a standardized format that you can uh, load program, uh, scores between different programs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my original Muse score, uh, the, uh, the XML file, which you can see here uh, was created in 2011, this... Uh, this XML file. Uh, that's something I created while I was working on this. So this is the actual XML file. Now, this file is very old. It's 10 years old almost. And I am now loading it into MuseScore 3.6 or something that is but a few probably hours away from becoming uh, 3.6. So there's some new things that you're going to see as I'm working with it. One is there's a new font that is the new font and I showed you this a few weeks ago there's both a music font and a text font the music font is just going to apply automatically the text font it's giving me the opportunity because originally uh, I think in finale it was using Times New Roman so I want to use the new font Edwin so that's something you can expect to see when you import music XML files going forward all right so I am importing this music XML file, and this is going to be the original orchestra version coming in from Finale. When I did this in MuseScore 1, I have to say the, um, the results were, you know, only so-so. In other words, uh, it wasn't very usable right away. The music XML import in MuseScore 1 10 years ago was pretty limited. It's a lot better now. But it's still the case that music, it's like Google Translate or something. If you try trans, if you try using Google Translate to translate something, it comes out as it comes out, but it's not perfect. Um, and 
So it's the same with uh, Music XML. But if you look at this, this is now actually looking a whole lot better than it did uh, when I first in imported it into MuseScore 1. Uh, everything is looking pretty decent. I know there's this extra little bit of text here, but then after that, I get to see my music here, and it really looks very much like it looked... Oh, but this isn't the orchestra version now that I'm looking at. I thought this was my orchestra XML, but now I see it's an XML that I exported of the uh, the playground version. I'm sorry, I thought this was the orchestra version. Um, let me see if I... Uh, I, I might have that version also, but I'm not going to worry about it. Because what the thing is, I imported it Dusk Orchestra XML. Let me take this version. It's not as old, so I don't really know when I exported this or if it was exported from MuseScore or Finale. But I definitely want to get some taste of it. So give me one second here to... Uh, get it going into MuseScore here. What I did when I uh, decided to uh, do this project 10 years ago, I knew, let's see, again I will apply Edwin, um, I sort of knew that the Music XML import process was likely to be problematic. So I used it I imported the XML to see what was going on, but when I created the score in MuseScore, I decided to just do it from scratch. In other words, not to just use that imported XML and then start editing it. I just imported it so I could see it and play around with it, maybe do some copy and paste, but I created the score from scratch. And I, I guess I would have to say that is still still my approach. In other words, if I have some large project that I want to import into MuseScore from another program, I will use Music XML to get me a starting place, but then I will probably go ahead and create a new score and then copy and paste content into it. And the reason is there's just a lot of stuff that when you when you import a Music XML gets set up for you like some different style settings and so forth, but maybe they're not they're not what you want. They're not. They're not the new. They're not the defaults. They're. They're stuff that's carried over from the previous program and MuseScore doing its best to reproduce how things worked in the previous program. But I don't. I don't want that. I, I want kind of a fresh start. So when I'm doing this sort of thing, let's see here. Ah, yeah, this looks like now an orchestra version, right? So you can see there's a whole orchestra here worth of stuff. So um. And there's all these extra text frames here uh, because I think that's the only way it knows how to deal with um, footers. So that's something to know about also when you when you export um, something from Music XML and it's got a footer. Music XML doesn't have a clear way of dealing with that, so we import it as text as these text frames and I, I pretty much don't want those so one of the things I'm going to do is get rid of all those I'm going to say select all similar elements to select all of these frames and then just press delete and that's going to get rid of all of those uh, all of those extra text frames so that's uh, one of the things that you, you there's a number of things you want to do just to get this imported file look reasonable so uh, yeah let me jump into a place. Here's like a, a little interesting looking passage. Well, then the audio is starting to, to go super glitchy because of whatever's going on on my system, I guess. Um, but hopefully you got um, some idea. That's sort of a big climactic moment. Um, okay, so um, if I were really doing this, what I would do is I would create my new score and set it up the way I want to set it up and then just sort of copy and paste some things into it. Um, so to do that, I'm going to go ahead and create my new score. I'll call it Dusk new version and uh, I'll put my name in here 
Now here's the nice thing in uh, 3.6 MuseScore. As I start selecting instruments, the instrument of this ensemble was unusual. It was, there was a clarinet who could play either uh, regular B flat clarinet or bass clarinet. And I think in my arrangement, I think I asked them to play bass clarinet primarily. So I'm, I'm going to just add a bass clarinet to the score. What else was there? There was a, a, a tenor saxophone and um, I think an alto saxophone. There was definitely a, vo a vocal. Now notice how it's adding these things. Uh, it's putting them in some sort of standard order. I, I typed the tenor first, then alto, but it put the alto above the tenor because that's correct. And now when I add voice, it's going to put voice in a proper score order, which is after wins, although for this purpose I might have wanted it above. Um, but uh, let's see, there was a piano, there were some strings, there was a, a violin, and a bass, but I think I'm going to put the bass as sort of the jazz version of the bass because that's really what it was. So I'm going to use acoustic bass from the plucked strings. And there it is. So this is, oh, there was a vibraphone. There was a vibraphone, vibraphone. Uh, that's percussion pitched. And that also got placed in proper kind of order. So this was my e instrumentation. And if I said there were eight people, and I now see that there's eight instruments here, I think I have the right ones, although I, I can't guarantee it was an alto and tenor sax, because now I'm doubting myself a little bit. Um, this piece has no key center, so I'm going to use the open atonal key center uh, key signature for it. It starts off. It starts off in four four, and it's got a whole bunch of measures. I'm just going to enter a couple hundred measures to start. And there was no pickup measure, so here's my starting score. One of the things that I can point out about this now as I uh, scroll through this is, um, yeah, it did, not only did it put the instruments in the right order, but it also bracketed them correctly, right? This is one of the nice new 3.6 things. So this is uh, what my starting place maybe should look like. Now I can compare it to what my other version actually looked like. Oh, actually, what I'm going to do is open the actual version. This is the version that I actually posted to uh, um, to musicscore.com 10 years ago. The one that says Playground. Oh, and it tells me it's corrupted because it was created with MuseScore 1. You've probably seen this message before about corruption, and I will say that every version of MuseScore has had bugs that will allow scores to get corrupted. Every time one gets like reported to us in a way where we can reproduce the problem, like we can see exactly how to reproduce that corruption from scratch, we fix them. But, you know, then new bugs show up and new corruptions happen. It didn't used to be the case that MuseScore would detect the corruption for you. So you would save a score and have no idea it was corrupted until something went wrong later. Um, that was maybe about five years ago we added the detection. So this score has been corrupted for 10 years. I want to take a look at the details here. And it's telling me staff 2, measure 75, is what's corrupted. All right, so I'm going to ignore that, load it anyhow, and it will load the file for me. And um, I'm going to go to measure 75 and just take a quick look at what's happening, uh, just so you can see something about that corruption. Oh, now this is <laughs> created in MuseScore 1.0, right? Um, so uh, it's giving me the opportunity to kind of import, to, to update the style. And I want to do that. I want to use Leland, the new notation font that wasn't available in 1.0. I want to use Edwin, the new text font. And I want to use automatic placement. That's, uh, although I'm, I'm a little confused by the wording here, but I'll, I'll talk to them about that. Um, and um, yeah, I want to apply that style. So when I do that, I notice it didn't get all of my text, right? What it did, uh, this is one of the things that happens when you import older scores. The, the, these text elements, if you think about like, if I double click, say, this text here, um, you have the ability to make just part of it italics, 
down here, or just part of it bold, right? In MuseScore 1, that's all there was. It had no concept of text style. So all of this text, all of the formatting, all the fonts are added one character at a time. And that's kind of, uh, let me undo that. Oh, I can't undo that change, apparently. Oh, well. Um, uh, so a lot of these text uh, sorts of things cannot easily be updated. And that's also the case coming in from Music XML. A lot of this text formatting is kind of like hard coded in that text. That's one reason I like to get a fresh start with things. But anyhow, now I can at least check my things. There's a voice, a violin, tenor sax, bass clarinet, vibraphone, piano, bass drums. I guess there was not a second saxophone, so I, uh, I guess I was wrong about that. So I'm going to go back to the instruments dialog by pressing I. And I'm going to take that alto sax and just remove it from the score because I guess I didn't have that. I guess I just had this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I just remember it being an eight-piece group, but I guess it was actually only a seven-piece group. So, um, so this is um, you know how things uh, will look now. What I would do then if I was doing this, and, and, and I actually did this, uh, so I'm, I'm just sort of walk through what this process looks like. This is that XML file of the orchestra. This opening section was two trumpets, right? Um, I'm going to copy and paste this. Now, there was a little time signature change. You might know that copy and paste does not copy time signature changes. So any time signature changes my piece, I am going to have to reproduce manually. So I'm going to have to look at this and go one, two, three, four, five. It's five measures, and then the sixth measure is three, four. So on my new version, I can go one, two, three, four, five. It's this sixth measure where it changes to three, four for just that one measure, and then back to four, four. All right. Then I can go back to my orchestra version, and then I can copy and paste this line to wherever I want it. So I'm going to copy it. You know, there's how long that line basically is. Um, and I think I chose to give that to voice and violin, uh, if I'm remembering correctly. So I'll paste it into the voice staff, and then uh, I'll paste this version, the second part, into the violin, because I think that's how it went. Yeah, I think that's how it was. Let's take a look. I had voice on the top and violin after that. Um, but yeah, that is what I had, voice and violin. Now, I will say as far as standard score orders, um, this is uh, worth uh, pointing out that this ordering that MuseScore put on me by default is orchestral ordering. Not that saxophones are common, but woodwinds in general. You'll have woodwinds, then percussion. And voice typically goes in here. Well, in a jazz setting, and this is not necessarily jazz, right? It's the Playground Jazz Project. It's this weird combination of uh, classical and jazz stuff. Um, if I switch from the orchestral ordering to the, say, jazz. I'm going to try jazz combo, see what it does. Now it's put voice on top, followed by the woodwinds, followed by the violin, followed by piano, then bass, and then the vibraphone at the bottom, which I wouldn't do. Um, I would move the vibraphone up. So I'm also going to check the jazz big band, just because I'm curious. I think it's probably the same. Looks like it is. So this is basically the ordering that I think I would like, except did the combo put the voice on top? Combo put voice on top. I'm going to go with that. But I am going to move the vibraphone further up. And I can do that. The up and down arrows have moved. They've kind of rearranged this dialogue a little bit. But I can move it up because it would normally go in, in, in my world probably here. Um, there's not any standardization for this type of ensemble, really, because it's such an unusual ensemble. In fact, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and do like I did before. I'm just going to move that violin up because one of the things that I do in a small group like this is I want the instruments in roughly order of, uh, in a small ensemble like this, highest to lowest in pitch. 
right? I don't really care about family groupings so much. I don't want to group all the strings together, all the winds together necessarily. I want to group them more by pitch. The voice is going to, the voice and the violin between the two of them, uh, one of them is going to be on top, and more often it's the voice on top because I'm trying to give the voice the melody where possible to make it possible to sing because this stuff is <laughs> pretty atonal in a lot of places and hard to sing. So voice, violin, tenor sax is going to be probably higher than bass clarinet more often than not, so I think I'm going to move that up also. And then I'll have my vibraphone, then my piano, then my bass. Oh, drums. I don't have drums in here, right? Uh, percussion, unpitched, drum set. Oh, and now that I've customized the drum set, it, it now that I've customized the order, it no longer knows to put that at the bottom. So, because once you have a custom order, it just adds it where you have selected. So I had the voice selected. So it's like, okay, I guess I'll add the drum set right after that. All right, so now I've moved the drum set to the bottom. This is the ordering that I actually want. Okay, so I'm copying and pasting into this score, and by doing that, I get to know that I've got all the good defaults on this score, and um, uh, even things like this, this, these dynamic markings, when I copied them over, I'm a little skeptical because I don't know that they have any formatting. I think, actually, I might want to not copy the dynamics. I might prefer to re-enter them because I don't, I don't trust the text formatting that happened on those things. So I think what I'm going to do is delete these dynamics. And um, for that matter, when I do my copy and paste, I want to not get dynamics anymore. So uh, this is what was a viola part, and I'm pretty sure I made that tenor sax. So I'm going to copy this passage, but when I do that copy, I'm going to go to View, Selection Filter, and I'm going to turn off, let me uh, just scroll up a bit here. I'm going to turn off uh, dynamic. I'm just going to not take in Dynamics. Um, I'm debating whether I want to keep the articulations and slurs and things. I think I will, but I'm I'm not going to keep the dynamics because I just don't trust that that music XML import that the dynamics the way they came in is the way I want. I don't. I'm looking at the font. I'm not trusting that it's all right. So by unchecking dynamics in the selection filter, now over here in the score, when I copy and paste into my new version. it'll copy everything except the dynamics. So notice, uh, let's see, in the original there was a, an MF here in, the, in that, uh, on that first quarter note there, but in my new version there is, where is it, right here, there is no uh, MF. Now it did get the crescendo marking because that is not a dynamic, that's a hairpin separate thing. So I really should have gone over here and uh, unselected hairpins also. Um, so anyhow, these are the things that I like to do to try to keep um, try to keep things, um, I don't know, fresh, to keep it, make sure that I'm getting the new defaults, getting everything really uh, the way I want it. And even things like, oops, even things like these slurs, I don't want to have to do the work of re-entering the slurs because that's a bit of work, but I am distrustful because there might have been manual adjustments on these slurs that I don't want. What I'm going to do when I'm done is select all the slurs and reset them, but I'm going to do that right now so you can see. I'm going to right click a slur, select all similar elements, and now the slurs are all selected and I'm going to press Control R to reset them just to make sure there wasn't any crazy finale formatting stuff that I don't want that came in on the import. I don't think there would have been, but I, I just uh, I, I just like getting rid of all of that. When I copy and paste from an old score, I just want to get it as clean as possible. And I'm willing to re-enter dynamic markings, uh, like here, knowing there was an MF there. I'm willing to do that, but I'm not uh, as willing to redo. So that was an MF. And uh, at the beginning of the score, I think also there were MFs. So I'll select both of those. MF. Um, 
so yeah, that's the kind of thing that I do when I'm importing this. And I'm also going to be looking over at my original to see, oh yeah, look at that. It was a double bar uh, at that entrance. So um, I want to make sure that I add that double bar. And again, this is the sort of thing that, yeah, just like time signatures, you wish we had a way to copy and paste with time signatures, with key signatures, with double bars, but we don't. It's been a common request. It's uh, There's a lot of issues with doing that, um, is all I can say is about why it hasn't happened. It's something, though, that we all know at some level we want to make happen. It's just figuring out how to best make it happen. So. I just selected the measure, clicked the bar line, and now I've got my double bar here. So this was the process that I used, but of course I'm not showing you the musical process of me having thought long and hard about, well, what instrument do I want to do what? Um, you know, that's 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 detail, that's music. I want to show you about what I'm doing in MuseScore. But this was my process, basically, copying things over and uh, re you know cleaning up the formatting as I did it. Um, Oh, here's the orchestra version again. Um, but often, if there were big passages, like, you know, you saw, like, look, um, this is one of the, actually, let's go to the big, big passage uh, towards the end. Um, this passage here has everyone playing at once. Yeah, you're not going to hear it. Um, that's, that's a shame, though. I, got, I wish I knew what was happening here. I'm going to try one more. Nope, just not going to work. Okay, so, um, you know, there's I don't have this many instruments to deal with. But when you're working on an orchestra piece, these aren't 20-something distinct parts, really. I mean, look at this. And then... Right, this is the same. You you know you might not have known that without knowing what clef we were talking about. But these two lines, these are in unison. Well, they're in octaves anyhow. And um, this passage here, is the same as this passage. Right, those are two flutes doing that in unison, but also the violins. Right, so. I don't have to have 20 instruments to get everything that I have here. I just give one instrument this line that was actually reproduced four times. I take one instrument to give it this line. And some instruments, like the vibraphone and the piano, are capable of playing more than one note at once. So all these half note chords that you see here, um, that is a pretty easy matter to say, hey, I can give those to just uh, a few instruments. I mean, you know, instead of having all of those half notes, whoops, let's get back there. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? Instead of nine instruments, there's probably, that's probably a four note chord, maybe a five note chord, but I only need like one or two instruments to play a four or five note chord. Um, yeah, because this is probably, this is nine instruments, but it's probably a four or five note chord plus doubling. Uh, if I look at the Dusk Playground version so I can see um, that was just before the end, so I know I can find that pretty quick. Here it is. Um, so you can see what I did. I gave the bass uh, one note. I gave the vibraphones two notes. And I let the voice have one note, the violin have one note. And that was about it. Um, I think I just decided that everything else was doubled and I didn't need. Um, so, um, yeah, those are some some kind of decisions you can make about how to reduce the texture while you do it. So really each section at a time, you know, this piece is in like a whole bunch of little sections and each section I'm uh, working on deciding what instruments I want to do what. I think I worked it all out on paper first, then I started to do it. Um, but I might have just flown by the seat of my pants. So the question is, do I still use Finale for any reason? And the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I I don't. I still have a Finale license, so if I wanted, I could install Finale on my Windows computer. Uh, I you know get new computers periodically. I haven't installed Finale on any computer in several years. I mean, I've I've updated computers recently. My current Windows computer, I think I got 
uh, maybe a year, maybe two years ago. I never installed Finale on it. I did, however, install Finale Notepad on it, the free version of Finale. It's like eight years old at this point, and it because they haven't been updating it, um, unless they have lately and I haven't paid attention. But uh, the free version of Finale is happy to export Music XML, which is a I, I'm so, so glad they did that um, because it means that that free version of Finale, the notepad, even though it's very limited, it can only work on a few staves at a time, it will gladly load any score you have. So I can take, well, probably not scores created since 2012, but I haven't used it since 2012. So I was able to take that orchestra score, load it into Finale Notepad, export it as Music XML. And I'm pretty sure that's where this version came from. I mean, I can't absolutely guarantee it. I wonder if in score properties, because it's possible that this, uh, yeah, it doesn't say. I didn't know if there was some little something within the XML file that says what created it. There might be if I added, if I opened it with a text editor. But in any case, um, because I'm wondering if I didn't export it, import it into MuseScore, then export it again. Uh, it's possible. I just don't remember. Um, so, uh, yeah, I do use Finale Notepad to take some of my old Finale files and um, bring them in and get them into Music XML format so I can import them into MuseScore. So uh, that's the only thing I ever do. Um, and, yeah, and Finale's export of XML is the best in the business because they invented the format. I mean, yeah, the people who work for Finale, and it, they essentially owned the format for many years, and it's it's sort of an open standard now, but it's uh, high, strongly associated with Finale people. And the fact that the free version allows you to export is just this wonderful feature that I, I do take advantage of. So anyhow, this this process of kind of copying things over so that I don't get this crap <laughs> like this. I have the ec the XML version. Apparently, somehow, I ended up with multiple. Do I have more? Do I have just two? Yeah, it looks like, oh, there's, yeah, I probably attached a uh, rehearsal marking to the violin staff because that's common in orchestra scores, right? Or things like tempo markings and rehearsal markings would get repeated above the strings. So the XML probably dutifully did that, but in MuseScore, you don't do it that way. If How do you do it? If I did want this repeated, I would actually delete this. And let me reset this one, Control-R. But then I would go down to the violin and re-add that as staff text a, but I would give that staff text the rehearsal mark style. Uh, there we go. So it looks like a rehearsal mark, but it's really staff text. And then when I go to generate parts from this score, there will be two, right, because th this rehearsal mark will show up on every staff. But then this staff, the violin staff, will also have an additional staff text there. But I'll just make it invisible when I do that so that uh, I can have this repeated. This is another thing. Yeah, someday we'd love to have a better solution for that. And that's one of the things that, you know, MuseScore 4, hopefully. We, we had, I, I had some hope that we would get that happening for 3.6, but it's not happening. Um, so uh, yeah, so that your exported music will have those. So you'll have to delete those and, and add them back as staff text, and then change their uh, change their text style. That's sort of a clumsy workaround, but it's the best we got for you right now. Um, so uh, these are most of the things that I wanted to talk about as far as this whole process of importing, because it's it's really very different after this, you know, how what you do from one score versus another. The basic ideas that I'm talking about here are common. What I do want to talk a little bit more here now is a little more about the context of what's happening here. Um, uh, so as I mentioned, 3.6 is about to come out like, in fact, um, eh. Okay. Uh, uh, it might come out today, might come out tomorrow, I don't know, but we're probably looking at this week, probably for MuseScore 3.6, probably. I can't swear to it. But um, uh, 
so that's going to happen and then you know there will probably be a 3.6.1 and 3.6.2 as whatever bugs get discovered get fixed but we're not doing any major new development on MuseScore 3 then it's all going to go towards MuseScore 4 and that's going to take a while because MuseScore 4 is going to have a lot of new stuff. Now, there's a lot of work that's already happened on MuseScore 4, but there's a lot left to do. So it's not coming soon, right? So MuseScore 3.6 is what we are going to be living with for, you know, months to come. And it's great. When I say living with, I don't mean stuck with. I mean we're going to be enjoying and, and you know, celebrating for months to come because it's a really fabulous release. So, um, but it's interesting that it is coming out almost exactly 10 years after MuseScore 1. So I'm looking at doing a bit of a retrospective over these next few uh, cafe episodes, looking a little bit more at the history of MuseScore, the history of my involvement with MuseScore, of, of MuseScore's own development, has, how new features have come about over time, and, you know, just uh, the, the shift in uh, the structure of, you know, who's been working on it and, and how the business model, all, all this stuff has really been kind of shifting and changing over time. And, and I just want to be talking about that over these next few episodes. Those are some of the things that I want to talk about. Um, let's see, do I anticipate that the import functionality will have any additional capabilities? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I guess I don't know what additional capabilities we might expect. Um, but I can tell you one thing is that Music XML is constantly in development and they've been making minor changes, minor changes, minor changes, and we've been trying to keep up with them. But just like MuseScore 4 is going to be kind of a big deal, Muse, Music XML 4, I think, is the next version. Whatever the next version of Music XML is, it's also anticipated to be a major, major revision that incorporates a lot of new stuff. And so, yeah, uh, whether that happens in time, whether whether they finalize what they're doing before we finalize what we're doing or not, I can't say how it's all going to come out time-wise. But yeah, at some point, I imagine we're going to handle uh, the, what this you know next generation music XML. In fact, I think they're not even calling it music XML, right? It's called MNX, MNX music next. I don't even know what it what it stands for exactly, but um. That's likely uh, that we will have that. Now, as far as additional formats, the problem is that, you know, Finale, Sibelius, Dorico, they don't, they don't document their file format. So we're not, we're, it's not likely we're ever going to be able to import anyone else's uh, formats directly. But our Music XML formatting, you know, uh, import will certainly get better. Also, Music XML is capable of representing a lot of formatting. Uh, we have generally chosen not to import most of it because things like, you know, in music, in maybe say in finale, you would customize the shape of that slur. So it looked, you know, a little longer than the default or a little taller than the default or whatever. Well, MuseScore's defaults are different than finale's defaults. So whatever manual adjustments you did in finale, they might not make sense in MuseScore. So we've generally ignored a lot of the manual formatting that comes in from music XML. But there's probably some manual formatting that we don't import that we could reliably import if we worked harder at it. And so that's something that we definitely might be looking at. Also, as far as export of Music XML, we're constantly working to improve that, mostly to make sure that the musical content, not so much the formatting, you know, we, we also will, you know, try to improve that, but the content, like, things like how ornaments and how trills and cadenzas and all these fancy features that you might have in um, a score uh, that aren't just plain sequences of notes, but you know that you had to do all sorts of fancy trickery in MuseScore to make happen. We want to export that to Music XML the best we can. And one of the reasons, one of the guiding principles is uh, we know uh, we take accessibility very seriously, and, and those of you who have been following this cafe have heard me talk about accessibility, uh, in particular so that MuseScore can be used by blind musicians, but also uh, so that MuseScore can be used in the production of Braille scores. So we want to export to Music XML so that the people who use Music XML to aid them 
in producing Braille scores because there's automatic tools to convert. There's semi-automatic tools where you might look at the, you might actually read the music XML in a text editor and then use that to help you create the Braille. This is how people create Braille scores by working with music XML exported from MuseScore. It's one of the ways anyhow. So we are constantly working to improve our music XML to make sure we don't lose uh, any information that someone would need to create a good Braille score. Now in MuseScore 4 we are going to have direct Braille export that's already been implemented. Um, but it's probably, you know, kind of rudimentary. If you're really a professional Braille transcriber, you're you're not going to be satisfied with the automatic export from, from MuseScore. It's going to be great for a lot of purposes, a lot of educational purposes, so that uh, a lot of music can just quickly have a Braille version. But a professional Braille transcriber is going to use, want to use the professional Braille transcribing tools, but they will rely on our, they do rely on our Music XML export. It's funny how long answer to, to that question because this stuff is all important, I think. Um, so anyhow, these are some of the things I'm going to be talking about over time and over these next few weeks are, you know, kind of a look back on MuseScore over the last 10 years, but also a look forward, what kinds of things you can expect. Uh, and a lot of this is not decided. We don't know for sure what MuseScore 4 looks like. We have ideas. Some things are pretty well settled, some things not so much. So, you know, I definitely want to have a conversation about that and, uh, um, let you know, give you uh, an update on what it is that we can share about this. So uh, I apologize again for all the uh, confusion at the beginning and the, the technical difficulties that I'm having, um, but I'm glad it's been working at least as well as it has been uh, so far. I will also uh, would be uh, remiss if I didn't uh, do my do. Uh, due diligence or whatever you want to call it here and make sure that I point out that this cafe is brought to you by the Mastering MuseScore School where I have all my online courses and if you're interested in really mastering MuseScore as the uh, as the name says then you really want uh, to check out my Mastering MuseScore uh, complete online course which is uh, I'll talk about that a little bit actually um, now, just because it is uh, relevant to this whole history thing, when MuseScore 2 came out, this was after I started to get involved with MuseScore, we put out a book. I wrote the book. Uh, it's right here. Um, called Mastering MuseScore. That was a, a very detailed uh, guide for using MuseScore. Um, but it, you know, started to gradually become obsolete and became kind of completely obsolete when MuseScore 3 came out. Well, maybe not completely, but obsolete enough. And I didn't really want to rewrite it having an online course is a much more efficient way of keeping up to date because as I update the course then even people who have already signed up get the updates. For um, MuseScore 4 we might start a new course. I don't really know exactly how that's going to work but uh, it, you know I've been so far updating everything for MuseScore 3 and I'll certainly uh, I might keep the MuseScore 3 course and then add a new one and then have everyone who's already signed up for MuseScore 3 be able to get into the MuseScore 4 course. Not sure how that's going to work to be honest but the, the point is that I'm constantly updating this course and will be updating it for uh, MuseScore 3.6 and it is definitely your 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 best way of learning MuseScore learning all the details of it if there's you know things that you don't know. And I got a lot of other stuff on my site also. So anyhow, that's the end of my commercial. So once again, I do apologize for all the technical issues that I'm having here um, today, but I'm glad that I was able to, to get things going. If I uh, just, I, I do want to come back to my uh, playground version of the score and just uh, see if this plays. Good.
right, that says floor tom roll, but obviously that didn't sound much like a roll. But anyhow, I, I wanted to play the climax, you know, the the uh, the final bit of it there because it, it is it does have this nice uh, climactic uh, finishing up kind of thing, and I definitely wanted us to get to hear some version of that, even if it's not the the really big orchestra version. In fact, just just because I have fun, um, I'm going to play the orchestra climax. Oops, that's applause. a little more convincing of a timpani role right <laughs> the real thing okay so um tomorrow uh speaking of which yeah tomorrow i will do the music master class as uh, as per usual i've been mentioning uh that counterpoint is now a thing that's uh increasingly on my mind because i'm going to be teaching a counterpoint course uh at a local university so i'm going to probably talk about counterpoint some tomorrow and just look at uh, music that people have uh um uh, have been uploading and all. So I definitely encourage people, if you haven't already signed up for the Music Masterclass, that's free. It's just like this cafe, but I, I have a place where you can upload music and stuff. So if you go to my site there, then you can click and enroll in the Masterclass and get informed about all the stuff I do there and have a place to upload your music so I can comment on it. And that's I'm very much looking forward to doing tomorrow and hopefully won't have any of these uh, technical glitches. So thanks everyone for being with me and uh, um, have a great week. Week, and I'll be back next week and also hope to see many of you uh, tomorrow for the music masterclass. Goodbye for now.